13th. And the second is the highly anticipated conversation with Claudia Rankin in conversation with Believer editor Jericho Brown on Monday, November 16th. And of course, don't forget our closing program of the fall with Shearing Fellow Megan Steelstra, who will be joined by Samantha Irby on December 2nd for the Launch Your Laptop Into the Sun event. Um, if you haven't done so, you can listen to the pilot episode of Black Mountain Radio wherever you get your podcasts or on our website at blackmountainradio.org. Um, so to begin, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Megan Steelstra. She's a 2020 Shearing, Fe Shearing Fellow with the Black Mountain Institute and 2021 Civic Media Fellow with the Annenberg Innovation Lab at USC. She's the author of three collections, Everyone Remain Calm, Once I Was Cool, and The Wrong Way to Save Your Life, winner of the 2017 Book of the Year Award from the Chicago Review of Books. Her work appears in The Best American Essays, The New York Times, The Believer, Poets and Writers, Long Reads, Tin House, and elsewhere. She teaches creative nonfiction at Northwestern University and is a mentor editor with the Op-Ed Project, supporting women's voices in public discourse. And our guest tonight is novelist and essayist Esme Weijin Wang. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling essay collection, The Collected Schizophrenias, for which she won the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize. Her debut novel, The Border of Paradise, was called a best book of 2016 by NPR and is one of the 25 best novels of 2016 by Electric Literature. In 2017, she was named by Granta as one of the best of young American novelists. And in 2018, she won the Whiting Award. In her essay collection, The Collected Schizophrenias, Wang writes about her experience as a woman who lives with chronic illness, including physical and mental illness. Opening with the journey toward her diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder, the essays in The Collected Schizophrenias discuss the medical community's own disagreement about labels and procedures for diagnosing those with mental illness and examine the manifestations of schizophrenia in her own life. She describes herself as a ferociously ambitious writer and delves into the tensions that chronic illness paired with this ambition have created in her personal and professional life. Part of her work is also dedicated to providing resources for other ambitious writers living with limitations in which she focuses on key themes from her own practice, resilience, excellence, and legacy. Uh, we highly recommend supporting local bookstores like our own The Writer's Block in Las Vegas by purchasing the collected schizophrenias through them. You can find a link to buy from The Writer's Block in the chat. Um, so we are very lucky and thankful to have Esme and Megan here with us tonight to please help us by welcoming through the chat Esme Weijin Wang in conversation with Megan Steelstra. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you to the Black Mountain Institute for hosting us tonight. We love you, Nevada. We see you. We are so proud to be here with you today and every day. Um, I also want to give some special gratitude to Sara Ortiz, Lily Allen, and Leila Muhammad for building these spaces where we can all come together and talk about language and literature and why it so desperately matters in this very beautiful, complicated mess of a world. Um, just quickly, I, I do want to acknowledge the history that is happening as we speak here tonight. There is the election. There is a public health crisis. Uh, racial uprising centuries in the making, and there are the deeply personal mountains that every single person here is moving every day. I know that some of you are involved in organizing and rapid response. Some of you are teachers or students in an impossible school year. Some of you are trying to make art. Some of you are trying to make rent. Some of you are caring for others, including seniors and small children and people whose health is affected by COVID. And in the midst, in the midst of all of this work, and fear and change, I hope that you're caring for yourself a little bit too. We so often put our own selves second or third or 10th. And if you see yourself in that sentence, I invite you to take a moment and breathe. I was just thinking earlier that I don't think I've exhaled in 72 hours. And one of the many, many things that I love about Esme's work is how it challenges me to listen to my own body. What makes it alive and challenging and unique and mine and deserving of care. And this awareness of my own self has me thinking about other people as well too and their bodies and what that means in the work that I do, what my students carry into my classrooms, what my kid is carrying in his body and everyone who I'm walking into the voting booth for uh, right now. 
Um, so the way that we're going to work tonight is Esme is going to read for us and then she and I will talk for a little bit and then I'll give her some of your questions uh, down at the bottom of, uh, of the weird and wonderful Zoom space we're in. There's a, a Q&A tab. So we do invite people to, to jump on in there and as time allows, I'll, I'll relay those questions to Esme. Esme, hello. I'm so happy to see you. So happy to see you and uh... You know, we, we have, we just, I feel like I just saw you not that long ago mm -hmm. in person, um, back when we could see one another in meet space. Um, and thank you so much for that really beautiful, uh, you know, kind of introduction and acknowledgement of the times that we're in right now. Um, I know that, uh, I have been trying really hard to not obsess over uh, the news, but it's very difficult right now. Um, I taught um, a workshop for Black Mountain earlier today, and my partner came in with a, with a, with a index card that said uh, Michigan was just declared, <laughs> um, you know, so. Uh, and you anyway. were born here, right? I'm sorry? You were born in Michigan? I was born in Michigan. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Hi, Michigan. We love you. Also. Oh, hi, Michigan. We love you also. Um, so I'm, uh, oh, here's the card. It's right here. <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> Michigan has been <laughs> called for Biden. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, the collective schizophrenia. Uh, this essay is uh, called The Choice of Children and is in part about uh, a camp for children with bipolar disorder and many other diagnoses that my husband and I worked at one summer and how this uh, impacted my decision to uh, have or not have children. Aaron was stocky with close cropped blonde hair. He liked football and rarely smiled. Julian frequently smiled and wore a green bandana around his neck. Mark wore the same clothes every day, a white t-shirt, cargo shorts, and a backward baseball cap. He collected small things like toy planes and pebbles to put in his pockets. Alex looked a lot like Julian except for the green bandana. Stuart, the smallest of the five boys, was short, thin, and had his shirt perpetually tucked into his shorts, with tube socks pulled up as far as they could go. As head counselor of our four counselor five boy cabin, C carried with him a massive blue binder filled with surveys. These surveys painstakingly filled out by the boys' parents prior to coming to Camp Wish covered the basics, comorbid or multiple diagnoses, severity of bipolar disorder, food preferences, hospitalization history, medication regimen, and so forth. The surveys also covered smaller, though still essential, details. One boy could sleep at night only while listening to his iPod. All the boys had bedwetting issues. They all enjoyed playing sports, which I dreaded. A question that I found particularly poignant in its frankness was, how do you and your child deal with the onset of rage or mania? For over a decade, I have not wanted or even considered having biological children, but these days I find myself frequently on the receiving end of unsurprising news. Where once the announcement, we have news from a couple almost inevitably meant a marriage announcement. The statement is now followed, particularly if the couple is heterosexual by, we're pregnant. Though those closest to me know exactly why I am not having children and exactly why I'm not considering adoption either, I'm still asked by a healthy few if childbearing and or child rearing is part of my life plan. If I barely know the person, I say something vague about having a severe genetic medical condition and leave it at that. If pressed further, I talk about the medications that I take, their potential detriment to a fetus, 
the complications that are likely to ensue postpartum and the genetic chances of passing my disorder onto my child. And there is also the question posed to me by those who seemingly cannot bear the idea of my not having a child in my life, but what about adoption? What I want to say is I have schizoaffective disorder. I was psychotic for half of 2013 and I could be psychotic again at any moment. I don't want to put a child through having me as a mother. I am livid at the inquiry. Once I did want biological children, and then hours after pausing in front of a children's clothing store in San Jose, California, I did not. It was early in my relationship with C, who was then still only a boyfriend, still in his early 20s. I watched women purchase tiny pea coats and miniature blouses with Peter Pan collars with my own shopping bags hanging at my sides. Later, I called him and said, I was at Jimboree earlier and I thought of you. Though he'd spoken several times of wanting to have children with me, this was the first time that I had, however vaguely, returned the sentiment. He was quiet. I talked to my mom, he said. I didn't understand. She said that mental illness is genetic. Oh, never mind then, I said. Forget I said anything. I didn't mean it. At the time, I had been diagnosed for years with bipolar 1 disorder, formerly known as manic depression, and primarily characterized in the DSM-4, the reference in use at the time, as a combination of alternating manic and depressive episodes. Symptoms of mania include a week or more of the following grandiosity, such as believing one has magical powers, a severely decreased or non-existent need for sleep, flights of ideas or racing thoughts, risky behaviors, impairment, and in some cases, psychosis. Depression is characterized by two weeks or more of symptoms such as depressed mood, diminished interest or pleasure in nearly all activities, fatigue, and feelings of worthlessness. However, no textbook description of bipolar disorder can match the experience of the disorder itself. K. Redfield Jameson writes, there is a particular kind of pain, elation, loneliness, and, and terror involved in this kind of madness. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder immediately prior to my freshman year at Yale University, 12 years before schizoaffective disorder made it onto the page. At six o'clock, I watched Stuart eat. He was on a restricted diet and seemed sullen about it. The other boys chatted about their first day, which had been fairly normal. There was some aggressive behavior, mild arguing, and a few mood swings here and there, though running around after the boys had not as been as bad as I'd feared. In fact, I'd been quite cheerful looking at the wild turkeys with Julian while the others played soccer. But I worried about Stuart. How many gallons are in a liter? He shouted in a robotic monotone. The boys looked at him, confused. 0.264, what's the largest dinosaur? Aaron snickered. Argentinosaurus. Why are you asking us trivia questions? Alice asked. They're not trivia questions, Stuart said stonily. They're science facts. Both Mark and Stuart had PDDs alongside their bipolar diagnoses. The most well-known PDD is autism. All PDDs involve delays in social interaction and communication. Mark had Asperger's, commonly referred to as a more high-functioning form of autism. Stuart had PDD NOS or PDD not otherwise specified. Mark, however, was far more high-functioning than Stuart, who seemed unable to carry on a conversation unless it involved shouting science facts or reciting in savant-like detail the plots of the Harry Potter movies. Aaron was the first to point this out. Stuart's a retard, he sang out as we bushed our dishes. Stop it, Stuart said, re reddening. Isn't he a retard? Retard, retard, and a crybaby. Most of the temper tantrums that day had been Stuart's, usually due to a spat over game rules. He enjoyed playing games, but exploded whenever a rule did not act in his favor. 
The other boys, sensing that Aaron had become the alpha male, joined in the mockery. We counselors jumped in. Hey, that's not cool, but it wasn't enough. And even now, I am not sure what I, as unprepared and unskilled as I was, should have done. My younger brother and his wife had a child last year. I am now an aunt and see as an uncle. We met our niece on the day she was born, arriving at the luxurious hospital room to take photographs and coo over the newborn. I did not hold her. I still have not held her. She knows who I am and will smile and wave when she sees me, her nose crinkling up as her eyes narrow with pleasure. I love her more as time passes and she grows increasingly autonomous, becomes a person. Kay's entrance into the world fills me with gut-churning anxiety. The world is in chaos. Earlier this year, a president whose platform rode on xenophobia and racism was inaugurated. I also fear that Kay will, as my brother's daughter, inherit the genes that initiated me into the schizophrenias. I once read that to have a child is to be forever afraid, though that attitude may be applicable only to a certain type of parent. As Kay's aunt, I feel I must be vigilant when it comes to her mental health. Someday, if we are lucky, she will be a teenager. She will likely be feisty. At the same time, we know absolutely nothing about who she will end up becoming. Thank you. I'm, in my brain, there is rapturous applause happening. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I was hoping you could um, just even maybe as a, as a place to start th thinking about this piece specifically. Um, in is this, so, so since the, the book is a essay collection, when in the in the process of it did you make a decision that this particular like the the choice of children specifically was something that that you wanted to address? Was it or was the piece made before you were already putting the book together? I'm wondering about the the process of it. Yeah, um, I feel like the choice of children was actually pretty early on um, in the process, even before I knew I was going to write an essay collection. It was um, it was actually something that I wrote before I knew that I could write nonfiction. It was something that I wanted to write about. It was something that I wanted to try and write about. It was something that really bothered me. It used to be called 13 times because I had read this article in Salon um, about how somebody with bipolar disorder, um, somebody with bipolar disorder who has a child, um, even if it's only one parent is 13 times more likely to have a child who has bipolar disorder or something like that. And that, mm -hmm. that, um, that statistic really stuck with me, especially because I went through all the comments, which um, you know, is not advisable. Um, and I just read so, but the thing was, I read so many comments that were from people who had parents who had bipolar disorder. And so that was a different kind of pain for me. Mm -hmm. There were comments like, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but I wish my, my, my mother has bipolar disorder. And so I have bipolar disorder and I wish I weren't alive. Um, or they would say like, I, um, my, I have a parent who has bipolar disorder and I had a horrible childhood. Um, just these, these people who had these stories and I just, there were stories that I couldn't take away from them you know, mm -hmm. because they were their, it was their lives. Um, and it, it, it was different from having like a, like these mean comments that you see on like other kinds of, um, other kinds of articles where people are just saying jerky things. Um, mm -hmm. Because these people had like their personal, their personal issues in them. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading all, I read every single comment and I, my heart just broke for all of these people who were suffering and had suffered and, and felt like they had inherited this terrible burden. Um, 
I don't think I read a single one that was like, I'm glad I was born, you know, like I, you know, I, I'm glad that my parent decided to have me, even though they have bipolar disorder, you know, and so that really stuck with me. And so that, that kind of got me thinking about this essay and I talk about this in the essay, but um, we, we were counselors at this camp and it was really difficult. Um, like I really fell in love with the Stuart kid. Um, I ended up becoming like his soul minder. Um, but it was so difficult. He was so difficult. And, you know, he had a single mom. And I remember just like driving home with C. And we were, we were driving home in silence, utter silence as we were going home from the camp. And I think one of us said, like, we could have a kid like that. And that was just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> did, did the writing about it do something for your heart at all? Did, did that allow you to put some of that down, do you think, or? Well, it um, kind of, but not really, because what ended up happening is that I'd written this one version of the book and, or one version of the essay, and it just kind of ended with like, you know, uh, I decided I didn't want to have kids and this is why, and like, it ended like that. Um, but uh, I found myself really struggling with that with the complications of that because and in part, which I mentioned in that, at the end of the essay, like I kept, it, it ended up being more complicated than I thought it was. And I, I even ended up taking this class um, called maybe baby. Um, and it's this, it's this like um, this kind of like life coachy class um, taught by this person named Brandy Buckley. I don't, I, I'm not sure if she still teaches it, but it's for people who are, who feel very ambivalent about whether or not to have children. Um, and, uh, and I, I felt, I felt very confused because on one hand I was like, I don't think I want to have children, but um, I had had a lot of kind of um, issues with my ovaries and I'd had a lot of surgery and like, I kept being told that like, as I was coming out of the anesthesia that I kept asking, like, is my ovary okay? Is my ovary okay? And like, I didn't remember. And when I, you know, was actually awake, I would say like, is my ovary okay? And they would say like, yeah, you, that was the first thing you asked, like when you were coming out of it. And so I, I felt like there was, there were, there were complications and I still feel like, I am still, you know, pretty sure that I'm, I'm not going to have kids and I'm like, I'm 37 and, you know, it's not impossible that I could, you know, have biological children, but, or, you know, or adopt a child. But I, I think that there's always going to be a part of me that really struggles with that, the, the kind of complexities of, of that. Mm -hmm. you know yeah I think it's a it's a conversation that I've been having with a lot of my girlfriends recently just I mean again I'm gesturing wildly at the world here right like it's a it's a I think it's a, it's an important question for us all to to be asking ourselves and and uh I, I want more human beings asking themselves these questions before they make the the choice to to bring a child into the world I I'm I'm interested in um a thing that I find really fascinating about essay collections kind of versus a memoir is, is when you sit down to read the forward moving memoir, uh, you're in, engaging with the whole book. And so often when we come to an essay collection, we've read one of the pieces somewhere else, right? So we always, mm -hmm. we, we step in, we step into the text already with an idea. And so the first piece that I read from this book, um, maybe some of you listening had a similar experience was the, the piece that was in the believer, hello to the believer here at the Black Mountain Institute, but um, uh, it's towards the pathology of the possessed, which is the, the second essay in here. And it's so deeply researched, so deeply scientific. And when I stepped into the book, that is that is what I thought I was going to be arriving to. So to, to have a piece like that next to a piece so deeply personal, like you put your heart on a piece of paper and gave it to us, um, was just a really 
kind of profound reading experience for me that had my body and my brain kind of moving on a lot of <laughs> cylinders and just not here to blow smoke up your ass for an hour, although I'd be happy to do that too. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, like how, how you arrive at these decisions, like, wh- like when is research going to carry the work? When is the autobiographical moment going to carry the work? Um, how does that kind of come into the discussion that you have with your yeah, like I was, I actually was talking about that in the in the workshop that I did with um, with y'all this earlier today with some mm-hmm. of the students because I um, I never intended to write nonfiction. Like I was, I, I, I my first book was a novel. I mm-hmm. I I focused in fiction in my MFA program. I took one nonfiction class. Mm-hmm. I I entirely wrote like memoir in that class and so um when i uh when i when i thought about um submitting something to the believer back then um Mm -hmm. when i before i wrote toward the pathology of the possessed i Mm -hmm. saw you know no personal essays and so uh toward a pathology of the possessed um Mm -hmm. is in some ways a personal essay, but it has a lot of that, you know, research and, you know, I had to do a lot of interviews and, and things like that. And, and that essay is actually how I taught myself to do all of that stuff. Um, And it was because I became really interested in, in kind of an intellectual way um, about, I, I became interested in an intellectual way about um, just the question of why does schizophrenia, why is schizophrenia seen as something that is like possession um, as opposed to so many other forms of mental illness like depression or, you know, anxiety or whatever. And I started to, um, I started to look into um, these uh, examples of things um, that, that kind of gave me examples of, of people who had experienced schizophrenia. And then, you know, the one that I focus on in the beginning of that essay mm-hmm. is the story of Malcolm Tay, who was murdered by his sister and mother, um, because he was so terrifying to them. Um, you know, he would like loom over their bed and say like the devil, like I, like, you know, the devil is like, is taking you over. And like, I, I need to like do something. And, and, and so uh, I became really interested in the idea of possession and as a metaphor for schizophrenia and how mm-hmm. um, that metaphor allows us to treat people with schizophrenia in different ways than we do um, people with depression or anxiety or, you know, various other forms of uh, mental illness. And so um and so it was through that that I was able to, you know, weave in my own experiences and to mm-hmm. talk about, you know, uh, my experiences in uh, involuntary hospitalization and then uh, this uh, in Laura's Law, which was this thing that uh, California was dealing with, um, trying to um, trying to get uh people who are dealing with very severe mental illness um, to be involuntarily hospitalized or involuntarily treated because if a person um, is possessed in in some way you know a la the exorcist or something like that um, then they don't have any um, autonomy and so we should be able to hospitalize them without their consent or we should be able to um, give them medication without their consent and so it, it became this like bigger project and so that was my that was my way of kind of um experimenting with writing a mm-hmm. different kind mm-hmm. of nonfiction. okay i i have a question for you about this but first i just want to kind of say to the 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 folks listening here I, I know that so many of you are writers so many of you are writing and and there's kind of always that feeling of well i, I only do this genre i never also work in this genre and it, it was just i think really powerful for me to just hear you as may say, well, I'd never written nonfiction before. I didn't know what I was doing. I had to figure it out through the work, right? So um, whatever it is you want to make, you can find the form that 
that lifts it up the way that you want to, to lift up your ideas. So, so what I'm saying is don't just say that you write novels, just <laughs> say that you write and figure out what, how to make what, what you want to make. And as me, I'm, I'm, I know that right now you're, you're doing two books right now, I, I believe. And right. One is a novel and one is a, is another is, is nonfiction again. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. what was the process before was n- novel and then the collected schizophrenia is right. And so I'm wondering if the, if the two genres are, talking to one another a little more this time or, or how, how is the process now different than it was before? Yeah. So um, I am definitely focused more on the new novel because the deadline for the new novel is soon. Um, although I think I'm getting a little bit of leeway be- just because of all of this. Um mm-hmm. But I find that because I have a little bit more experience with how I write nonfiction, I've already started to kind of make a home for my, for, for this new nonfiction book. So like I was actually just talking to the students about like how, like, this is my little, um, well, this would actually be more useful if I were like leaving the house, which I'm not, but if I were leaving the house, this is like, where I keep my blank Those index cards. Index cards? Yeah. And then this is like where this is a passport holder, but it, it holds index cards really nicely. And so these are the blank index cards. And then these are the index cards where I keep keep notes. Um, and then when I and then I've all are also already transferred some index cards into this box, which will eventually be the book. And I find that um as the book expands or the, the, you know, the more index cards I accumulate, the box will get bigger and bigger. So like mm-hmm. the box I have for the collected schizophrenia is I still have, like it, it still has all the index cards in it. It's like this big, um, but it starts out as a small box. And so it, you know, it just has like a, a very small number of index cards in it. Um, so like this is this is like the very beginning of the nonfiction book, and so, you know, uh, normally I would say, oh, well, like I, I, you know, I'm waiting until I'm done with a novel, and then I'll start working on the nonfiction book, and I'll start thinking about it. But, but I find that like I'm already interested in things, and like I'm already like paying attention to things, and like there are little things that like catch my attention, like. I became really um, intrigued by uh, the National Theater production of uh, Angels in America from Mm -hmm. 2017, 2018. And um, and so I I managed to acquire a recording of it. So I've been watching it over and over again. And then I acquired uh, the script for it. And then I've just been like walking around my house, like performing it. And like, I am trying, like, there were just a lot of things that I'm doing and I'm thinking a lot about angels in America and like what it has to do with um, the topic of the book and like what it has to do with how I think about illness and how I think about ambition and how I think about um, it's just all kind of moving in the back burner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, I'm not actively writing, but I'm not not working on it. Mm -hmm. Like I have a, I have a file that's, Mm -hmm. um, that's on my uh, computer and I'll I'll, like dip into it and, and make little notes, but, but I'm mostly working on the novel. Yeah. 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 Now you, you just spoke a little bit about ambition. And and so I would, I would like to bring that up real quick and then I'm going to kind of start working everybody I'm seeing all the the questions coming up so we're going to start working in some of those as well too but I I know the nonfiction book and and um you are here with the Black Mountain Institute as the breakout nonfiction writer and I love it that you here as a nonfiction writer are also speaking so so wonderfully about the fiction that you make as well too I'm also really interested in how just the the mindset of that infuses in your work like there's a, a wonderful scene in the collected schizophrenia is where you wake up your husband and you you ask him to start telling you what is what is really real. And so mm-hmm. you talk about, okay, our house is real. The president and the vice president are real. And I was, I just reread that line this morning 
just like that should actually be fiction and it's not. And <laughs> what are we even living in right now? Um, but I, uh, in thinking in terms of ambition, I, I know that that is what the upcoming book is about. And recently on Twitter, someone asked you what your TED talk would be about. And you said, redefining ambition through the lens of limitation. And, and I, I have read the article in L that, that you wrote about that. And, and I was just really moved and challenged by it. But just the, the tweet, that was the first time that I saw you use the word redefine. And I got really excited thinking that like Esme is now going to come in and like <laughs> fix all of our screwed up selves. And, um, and what an important time right now to be talking about what ambition really looks like. And I'm sure there are many people other than just me listening who have been struggling with productivity and thinking about what that means. And, and I was hoping you could speak a little bit to that and then I'll, I'll pull some questions into the conversation. Yeah, I mean, well, I am sorry to say that at this moment, I do not have the solution um, for all of our productivity anxiety and for um, capitalism and ambition and how all of those things um, work together. Um, what I can say is that I was raised, um, particularly as the child of immigrants, to have a really strong work ethic and to be really ambitious. Mm -hmm. And to um to to look at those things as really important and so for a really long time and for a lot of my life i saw working hard and being ambitious and always wanting to be the best as the most important things about me like i think even more than like being a kind person or um or being compassionate or em empathic or um, I think those were the things that really came to mind when like I really thought about like what was good about me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that became a huge challenge when I got, when I started getting really sick. Mm -hmm. And so first um, my mental health issues got a lot worse. And I was unable to um, <coughs> function cognitively um, in the way that I um, was accustomed to, which is really scary when you value your mind or have always been taught to value your mind. Um, but it, it became really, really scary when I became really sick and really chronically sick and disabled with whatever, um, whatever happens um, in like 2013, 2014 mm -hmm. and like continues to be the, the thing that I am dealing with. Um, I'm doing a lot better now, but um, it, was defined as a number of things. I've received a number of diagnoses. There was a period of time um, and in the collective schizophrenia as I um, talk about how chronic Lyme was a diagnosis that I mm -hmm. kind of attached myself to because there was no um, diagnosis that I could really um, find a uh, a way to attach myself to. And I, I do want to say just really quickly that um, chronic Lyme is a really um, controversial diagnosis. It's not one that the CDC really takes seriously. And I just want to say really quickly that people don't tend to, or I can't speak for everyone, but I do want to say just to get on my soapbox that people don't tend to attach themselves to quackery um, or things that people make fun of or, um, or alternative medicine because they want to. It's because traditional Western medicine doesn't give them any options. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when you've reached the end of the line and you go to all of these doctors and um, if you're lucky enough to have health insurance and you're able to go to traditional Western medicine 
and none of them are able to give you answers. You'll just go to whoever is willing to give you an answer. And so that um, it was basically what my life was for um, about four or five years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so now when people ask me what I, what is wrong with me I just say I'm chronically ill I don't I don't know what it is I've gotten a lot of different answers but anyway mm -hmm. I mean so um so I became disabled um in a more significant way than I had before and uh because I was disabled uh my self-esteem declined quite significantly um I think something that uh I had to really grapple with was just not being able to do things. Um, and uh, like the word disability has to do with being less able to do things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think uh, I started worrying, like, am I just lazy? Do I just not want to do things? Um, you know, people would tell me like, oh, you're not lazy. Like you wrote an entire book. You wrote The Border of Paradise. It like won all these things. And I was like, yeah, but I haven't written another book since I got really sick. Like, what does that mean? And so I started having to think about all of these things. Like, what does it mean to be ambitious? Is being ambitious important? Does it, is it like, what is the relationship between disability and capitalism? Um, and I talk about this a little bit in the collected schizophrenia as well, because a big definition of what uh, a high functioning person with schizophrenia is, is somebody who is able to work or have a job. And that is obviously um, something that is directly related to capitalism um, and how much mm -hmm. money you're able to make, how much you are mm -hmm. able to produce. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I started to have to think of myself as like, am I a useful person if I just lie here in bed all day, every day, and I do this for like a month. What if I do this for a year? What if I do this for like two years, three years? Am I still worth anything as a person? And so um, those were a lot of the questions that I had to think about. And mm -hmm. um, that's kind of just the seed of mm -hmm. this book that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I feel as though there are 200 people here right now who are ready to give you their credit card for the, the hardcover <laughs> version of that. We're, you take your time, my friend. Like we're, we're, we're ready for you if, if you come out here. Um, I, I have, okay, I, I, there, are, there are so many wonderful questions here. There are such brilliant people here with us right now. Um, uh, here's one. What is your opinion about diagnosis? Uh, and I know that you right now you've been talking about it broadly and so far as schizophrenia and also in line, but th th this one is, is pretty specific to what is your opinion about diagnosis and the ways that people with post-traumatic stress are often diagnosed with bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and sometimes schizophrenia? Um, oh yeah. Like I, that's a toughie. Like I remember I had been diagnosed with, um, with chronic Lyme for a long time. And, um, and I was really struggling with just like all of these physical symptoms. And I finally, um, I think my psychiatrist at the time had always wanted to say this to me. And she finally said to me, do you think that this is just your PTSD? And I remember I was so angry. I was like, this is not just my PTSD. This is like, I am like fainting. I like, there are days I can't move my arms. Like there, I, I was just like livid at the thought that like, that all of this could be trauma-based. And yet there are, there is a, a whole there's a whole body of work about trauma and how it affects people's bodies and particularly women's bodies. Um, there was a book um, called uh, by Amy Berkowitz um, called Tender Points, um, which is really good, um, but it's about uh, her and uh, fibromyalgia. 
and how she developed fibromyalgia almost immediately after recalling this very traumatic incident in her life. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, complex PTSD is one of my diagnoses. Um, it is one of my diagnoses among many of my other diagnoses. Um, I have been diagnosed with many of the things that you listed in that question. Um, and I think that in some ways, it's all, it all kind of mushes together, you know? Um, I was actually just talking about this um, on social media where, um, you know, if you look at different points in my life, you could say that I have, I could have qualified for an OCD diagnosis and a generalized anxiety disorder diagnosis and a PTSD diagnosis and um, like various other, and a social anxiety diagnosis. But like, to me, what so many of my diagnoses are, are is this kind of like mush that, um, and this is just how I see it, that um, that just exhibits itself in different ways. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that I um, define myself with all of these diagnoses because I don't necessarily think that it's super useful to always like lead the way when I introduce myself with like, I am Esme and these are my 14 diagnoses. Um, but um, so I, I, I tend to just lead with like the ones that I find most useful. Um, but yeah, I, I think... Um, I think that diagnoses in general, and I say this as someone who worked in a lab and was a lab manager and um, worked in a mood and anxiety disorders lab at Stanford, like diagnoses and clinical diagnoses, they're all way more complicated and way more um, mushy than, mm -hmm. than we would like to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to build on this question here a little bit with with another one from the the Q and A section here to thinking that um, not just about like introducing yourself through diagnoses, but it kind of gets into some some other aspects of identity as well. So um, I'm interested in how the intersections of your identity, i.e., disability, being a woman of color, etc., and how that also influences your decision to have children, um, especially in a time where folks deem themselves as allies, but so often do not do the background work to help us with intersections of marginalized identities get justice. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it does. I, I feel like, I feel like there are ways in which um, there are certainly privileges in my life that allow me to kind of work around um, the marginalizations in my identity. Um, for example, um, like having an invisible disability mm -hmm. um, is can can let me pass. Um, in public in ways that uh, other ones don't or just um, or I identify as queer but I'm married to um, to a man and uh, and that's also a way that I can that I can pass um, but I th think that Marginalized identities and intersections of marginalized identities and the issues of discrimination and the lack of justice is, I think, perpetually an issue, including when it comes to having children. Um, and I'm thinking just about, you know, even when it comes to having to educate your children, your 
you know, imaginary, my imaginary children um, about what it means to be my imaginary child. You know, what does it mean to be um, the child of a person like me? Um, what does it mean when people look at mommy who's using a cane? Um, what does it mean when like mommy gets treated differently at the airport because she has to use a wheelchair? Like, what does it mean? Like there's, there's all kinds of things um, that kids, even if they themselves do not have that marginalized identity get looped into because of their parents. Um, like I do not have the broken English of my parents, but I, as the child of parents with broken English, like that, that had an impact on me growing up. And I, um, and I kind of, it rubbed off on me you know, or to be with them. I, does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it's a complex question, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think there, there are many people in the comments who are, are interested in, in talking about some of these questions of, of identity diagnosis. Um, there's also a lot who are deeply interested in, in what you do as a craftsperson. Um, I, I want to throw this one out here. Thank you for your work as a thought leader to concepts of mental health and chronic illness. I want to second that to you personally. Um, but the question, what is the process of deciding to write fiction or nonfiction? Specifically, how do you differentiate between the genres as you process your thought and your best questions? Ooh, um, to be completely truthful, this is a safe space, truthful space. Um, to be completely honest, I am my most honest in my fiction. Um, I can hide the best when I'm writing fiction. Um, that's not the only difference, but it's the one that comes to mind first. Um, other um, choices that I make. Um, I also tend to go to fiction if I want to understand another viewpoint um, in a really thorny issue um, that I'm finding difficult mm -hmm. to do in nonfiction. Um, and so I'll put myself I'll write something from the point of view of the person that I don't identify with um, or that I don't find it easy to empathize with. Um, and then I'll write, I'll write a piece from that perspective. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Those are a couple of the things. Yeah. I, I want to tie a kind of tie a couple together here right now. Um, uh, I am an Asian American prose writer with bipolar one disorder. And my question for you is, how do you manage depression or mania during the winter and stay positive so that you can work on your creative writing projects? And then I think there's also a, a, another question later on that I'd just like to add to this about like, if, if that question was, how do, how do you keep going in the winter? This other question is, how do you keep going right now? <laughs> like in the, in this current political climate, um, I'm editorializing a very long comment right now, just cause I have one eye on the clock, but um, I think, how, how, how do you keep going? Yeah, um, I think just the, the question of how do you keep going? Um, the th first thing that comes to mind is something that uh, my therapist used to talk to me about when I was dealing with a great deal of physical pain. And I bring this up because um, when I started to deal a lot with chronic pain, I realized that so much of it also um, could apply to mental suffering. Um, 
And she told me this story about um, a woman that she knew who um, was enduring a night of very, very terrible physical pain, just awful, awful, awful suffering. And, um, and she could not bear to think of making it through the entire night. And so instead of thinking, I got to make it through this entire night, um, or even I got to make it through the next hour, or even I got to make it through the next half an hour, or even I got to make it through the next 15 minutes, or the next 10 minutes, or the next five minutes, or the next 30 seconds, she would tell herself, I got to make it through the next 10 seconds. And then she would just get through the next 10 seconds and, and not look past that 10 seconds. And then when she got past that next 10, that 10 seconds, then she would get past the next 10 seconds and not look past that next 10 seconds, not think like, okay, then I got like this 10 seconds after that. And then I got to do this other 10 seconds. And this whole night is going to be made up of like 10 second increments. It's going to be forever. No, just 10 seconds. And then, then when you're done with that, the next 10 seconds. And I really, that really, really, really stuck with me. It stuck with me through mental suffering it stuck with me through physical suffering and I just that's I don't know that's that's the best advice I have is mm -hmm. to just get through the 10 seconds mm -hmm. on on this day four years ago uh, I was teaching a creative nonfiction class and I emailed everybody. I said that they didn't have to come to class today, uh, but that I was going to go there and I was going to read if anybody wanted to come. And everyone in the class came. There were 13 writers uh, and two of them were guys. And then the other 11 were young women. And remember about a month before that, the Access Hollywood tapes had come out. And, and that day, um, a, lot of, a lot of the young women in the class were telling stories about sexual assault. But on that day after the election, those two guys, completely independently of each other, uh, brought in something for each one of the young women in the class and me. Like one of them brought 12 cupcakes and one of them like brought in like a bouquet of flowers and gave each one a flower. And we were like, dude, like, dudes, why? Why? And they said that their first thought on hearing that Trump was the president was of the women in class and the stories that they told. And that moment on that day was really huge for me about thinking about the work that, that we do in the world. And so I, I, I think about like where are those two guys gonna end up? Like maybe they'll be in the Senate, like who, who knows? But um, those stories mattered. And I, I think about what your work does in helping us see people with mental health difference. And, um, and uh, that's, that's I think why, why we do this work in the world. And I am very, very grateful to you for, for what you have taught, for what you have taught me specifically. Um, all right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we can keep going with thousands and thousands of questions, um, but I do have one eyeball on the clock. Claire, what are you thinking? Should we, should we close our time here? I'm not, I am happy to keep going. I think it's either however you want, if you want to ask another, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. How are you feeling about that? Okay. I think it's, I think we have until, until eight, right? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Esme. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everybody. Great. Thank you everyone for being here. Thanks to our guest, Esme Weishin Wang and our moderator, Megan Steelstra. And thank you to all of the attendees in Vegas and Reno and beyond for being here tonight. Um, and again, please support our indie bookstore, um, The Writer's Block, by purchasing the collective Look. schizophrenias. Yeah, from them. Um, there's a link in the chat to do so. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And you have a good evening.
Have a good evening. Thank you.